Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. My name is Christoph Neidart. I'm a member of the Library Committee. First, some housekeeping. Um, please switch off your phones or put them on the manual mode. And then we still have COVID. That's why we have this kind of seating. seating. Uh, until now, we had uh, acrylic uh, 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 cage here too. If anybody uh, opposes us to, objects uh, us to speak to you without that, you should please ask, uh, please tell us, then this, the people will, uh, will bring those acrylic windows again, but I hope you're fine with us talking without a cage. Uh, and finally, a warm welcome to Alexandra Babovich with her book, The Tokyo Trial, Justice and the Post-War International Order. Unfortunately, we, today we don't have copies uh, to sell, uh, but uh, the book is on Kindle and you can also order in uh, at Amazon as a hard copy. The Tokyo Trial has been published by Palgrave Macmillan in a new book ser series called New Direction in a East Asian History. And this is an imprint of Springer based in Singapore, not in Europe or in the States. And have a look at it. It has some very interesting titles. Dr. Babovich is an assistant professor at Osaka University uh, Graduate School of Human Science. She has also been lecturing at Kyoto University. She obtained her PhD from Kobe in political science. Her bachelor and her master's are from the Institut d'études politiques de Paris, also known as Sciences Po. That's the number two university in world ranking for political science. Uh, it has some um, rather well-known alumni like François Mitterrand, Jacques Chirac, uh, Pompidou, uh, François Hollande, Emmanuel Macron, uh, the former United Nations Secretary Boutros Boutros Ghali, and the fashion designer Christian Dior. <laughs> and now Alexandra Babovic. Uh, she has, um, she's Serbian. She did her high school in Belgrade and went, then went to Paris. For people who grew up in uh, other countries than former Yugoslavia, uh, war crime trials are kind of distant history. When you grew up in uh, Serbia or um, in Rwanda, by, uh, but who grew up in Rwanda here, uh, then this is rather a, a topic of the present. Both the Nuremberg Tribunal and the Tokyo Tribunal were made uh, were meant to create a legal narrative. For the first time in history, uh, military uh, actions, uh, war crimes were supposed to be uh, an individual re responsibility. Uh, establish an, it, they were supposed to establish an international jurisdiction against aggressive war and war crimes. But it was a very selective uh, responsibility. Vietnam, Cambodia, the Iraq war, Chechnya, and now Ukraine have never been tried in such in, in a such tribunal. And the atomic bomb, certainly the one in Nagasaki, would certainly qualify as a war crime. But there were two international uh, humanitarian trials, uh, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. As many other books of young scholars, Tokyo trial is based on Dr. Babovich's dissertation. But other than most um, dissertations turned into books, her dissertation won a prize. To be precise, I've done my homework, the 18th Asia Pacific Research Prize, or EUA Prize. As Japan correspondents, we have a cursory knowledge of the Tokyo Tribunal. Maybe one could call it a tabloid knowledge. We know it was kind of the far eastern version of Nuremberg. There were 28 defendants who stood trial, seven were sentenced to death, 15 to life in prison. 
the emperor was not the defendant, although there were fierce arguments if he should be or not. The Indian judge, Paul, disagreed with the sentences. And in, in Japan, he's honored for that, although for a rather distort, distorted version of his uh, opinion. Then what certainly all journalists knew who have been here for a few years, Kishinobusuke, Abe's grandfather, was jailed, but not tried. He was not guilty and not innocent. And he certainly uh, gave a pre uh, generally, generously paid uh, the Americans back for this. He was prime minister 57 to 60. Last but not least, what everybody knows, in 1978, 14 class A war criminals were secretly enshrined in Yasukuni. China and Korea still put protest against that, against that. No that, doubt the Tokyo trial was victor's justice. But are these men really martyrs, as some in Japan claim? And are the Japanese really innocent? I doubt it. Kishi was considered a class A war criminal, and the outrage about the Yasukuni enshrinement focus on, focuses on class A. We think these are the worst. Actually, that's not true. That's only a classification. Class A is crimes against peace, class B is war crimes, and class C is crimes against humanity. And these are kind of, if you can say so, equal crimes. Uh, in Yasukuni, there are 1,088 class B and C uh, war criminals enshrined, but obviously the world doesn't bother about them. There are many books about the Tokyo Tribunal, Tribunal but Alexander Barbovich draws a wider historic arc from 1945, well into the late 50s, or if you want to think of the enshrinement until 68. And she puts the trial into a uh, historical context of these other uh, war criminal trials. I knew before the Tokyo trial was flawed, flawed justice, but I didn't know how flawed. One important example is how the list of defendants was put together, what deals were made. Uh, it shouldn't be too many defendants, so 28 was just about right. So some people got away with the same crime as other people were tried for. And uh, there was a lot of negotiation who uh, would be tried or not. The Americans, of course, they thought of Pearl Harbor, the Russians rather thought of Russia. The main problem, as I learned from her book, is that judicial and political actions were mixed, or rather politics was made with legal means or judicial means. The victim, victim nations had very little to say. The trial was orchestrated by Washington with the other nations playing uh, some, some uh, supporting roles. The comfort women station was not topic of the trial because of course the comfort women were basically uh, colonial subjects, so they were not that important. The unit 731, the, the B, B, B and C uh, weapon uh, uh, unit was not tried because the Americans made a deal with them. They got the research and the, the people who run that unit were let free. Several judges and prosecutors, the British among them, represented colonialist states. So they didn't want to set the precedence against what they did in their own countries, in their own colonies. The great George F. Kennan called the Tokyo trial hocus pocus of judicial procedure. It should ha rather have taken place as an act of war, not justice. So they just have, should just have shot them. Hocus pocus was certainly also the pseudo pardoning in the 50s of the war criminals. And that's enough of hocus pocus for me. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Mr. Nadehart, for your flattering uh, introduction and welcome. 
I would like to thank uh, Foreign Correspondents Club uh, members and the uh, audience who is present uh, in person and those who are also as well on Zoom. Well, without further ado, I will um, go proceed with my presentation. Uh, I will share here slides. Okay, so <clears throat> just a moment. All right. So before I start, I owe a few words on uh, how this book came to life or why did I choose to <laughs> write about this. So as Mr. Neidhardt mentioned, I um, spent uh, my uh, graduate studies in France. And at that time I um, decided to study international public management. And that's basically professional training for people who want to become diplomats or well, pu international public servants. And at that time, I had a lot of classes on international law. And uh, after actually at the beginning of one class, there was one professor who called me out and said, uh, please, Ms. Babu, stay after the course. And of course, the rest of the students looked at me and wondered, why does she have to stay myself as well? I don't think I could focus on class. I was thinking what's going to await for me after this moment. And then uh, at the end, she puts, me, she puts me aside and she tells me, well, you know, uh, your country is going to be talked about when we talk about all these topics. And uh, I would like you to not say much, not get emotional. You need to put your emotions aside and uh, be very open-minded. We had a lot of students actually from Serbia who would react uh, maybe emotionally to the topics. So that was my first kind of encounter with, uh, well, legal analysis of what was going on and what some of people I knew lived on the ground. It's very different, of course. And then fast forward, I had to write my uh, dissertation, but oddly enough, uh, you don't get to choose your dissertation, you were assigned a topic. And I was assigned the development of international criminal justice. and. Of course, I had to learn from Nuremberg and Tokyo to present day uh, present day uh, international criminal tribunals. And uh, OK, that uh, ended well. I learned, <laughs> well, a, a lot of things, right? And then uh, a year later, when after I graduated, I found myself in Japan. And my intention when I came to Japan was to break a little bit from European studies, Japan was new to me, it was exotic. I had this uh, excitement. And uh, when I came to my professor's lab, he said, well, you know, here we do diplomatic history. And my intention was not to study diplomatic history. I thought I would do Japanese modern day foreign policy. And then I was in a problem because I now had to choose something from the past to study about, and I didn't know what would that be. And I thought, okay, what are my, resources, what do I know, what do I already know about? And then I said, okay, wow, international criminal justice a year before. So then I actually uh, remembered Tokyo Tribunal, right? And this is how now looking back, this topic came to me. And of course you have to find something to contribute with. It's not just about, okay, let me study this. But I noticed that at the time when I was starting the my research, there were a lot of publications that were bringing to light uh, historical facts because uh, the uh, historical records for Tokyo Tribunal were declassified way late, much later than the ones for Nuremberg, right? So it was in the 80s and then we had declassification of um, different archival materials from former uh, Japanese colonies, which basically invited more research. But then I noticed that uh, I had some questions and one question was, um, well, what, what do politicians think about when they choose to use tribunals in peace processes? What do they want to achieve? How, let's say, are these tribunals, in what measure are they political and how much are they actually legal? So that was my first question. And another question I had was, what happens after geopolitical situation changes? So what do we do with these war criminals? And uh, at that time I knew because we had different classes on diplomatic history that actually in the 1950s after the occupation uh, ended, Japan became, uh, well, not that late, but officially 
uh, part of the, well, liberal club and a friend of uh, US. And I thought, okay, well, under these new circumstances, what did they do with those uh, war criminals that they so uh, severely criticized at the time and called them villains and all these pejorative names? So basically my research wanted to combine my legal background uh, and, uh, legal, and, and the background or actually newly uh, acquired uh, training as a diplomatic historian. So it's a mix. Of course, that's not very popular in Japan to mix disciplines, but I didn't know a different way because I was um, always used to multidisciplinary education and looking at the same phenomenon from different uh, aspects. And law and history are very different disciplines. They have very different interests. History wants to uncover as many facts, evidence as possible and build a narrative that is inclusive. But law does the opposite. <laughs> law takes definitions of crimes and then tries to pick facts that correspond and that can be actually qualified as crimes. So you see they have very different actually objectives. So as I said, my book look at, looks at those two extreme moments uh, when we talk about the tribunal, when the passions of war were still very high and when the interest in persecution was uh, actually at its peak and then 10 years later what happens when japan becomes an independent state and um, actually uh, acquires status of an ally of course i have to choose what i will be talking i cannot tell you everything <laughs> then you would not maybe be uh, let's say, have incentive to read the book, but I chose few points that I want to talk about. And I will structure my talk around just briefly, uh, maybe for if there are people who are not that familiar, just a little bit of explanation on, uh, let's say, what were the goals of Tokyo Tribunal and what are the crimes that were prosecuted there. there that's uh, my first point. And of course, it's a dark and painful chapter in Japanese history. So we just want to look at that. The second point is very interesting because war before World War II was not a crime. It was a political act of state, of traditional statecraft. States were just, it was their sovereign right to wage wars and defend their national interests. So this is the first time where we officially actually want to criminalize waging wars. That's a story that is worth saying. And then, uh, of course, you might wonder what happened to the emperor. And that's something that I will be talking about, why he didn't make it basically uh, to the dock. And the third point, uh, third point, we look at what happened to the war criminals, as I said, in the times of peace, so uh, freely independent Japan. Uh, and oddly enough, society and politicians stand together with those war criminals, and actually they pressed the allied governments and especially the US to release them. And then in the end, I will talk about the process of their reintegration in the society. So how them as the war criminals actually reintegrated political life or social life of Japan and how some of them were enshrined in uh, Yasukuni shrine, which gave them status of divinity in many ways. Of course, uh, Richard Miner was the first in 1970s to talk about Victor's justice. It's not, he didn't coin it. Even one of the defendants in the Tokyo Tribunal said this was a Tojo Hideki. You heard about him, I'm sure. Uh, he said this was a political trial. This was Victor's justice. And Victor's justice means that we use actually uh, law to actually very harsh uh, punishment for our enemies and we actually downplay the actions of the victors right so although i don't disagree with this argument i think that today we have more information to nuance it and what what do i mean by this is that usually international uh, criminal tribunals have wider goals it's not just to punish individuals usually those who make them uh, also associate them with larger piece of object objectives and I wanted to look at that. What was that in case of Japan? What did um, at the highest political level, so the leaders uh, of uh, the allied powers, and then uh, all those people who came to Tokyo, all those prosecu prosecutorial teams and judges from respective countries who gathered in Tokyo and had to actually uh, build the tribunal. 
So how did they, what did they want to do? And how the independent were they? Were they? So the first goal was, uh, and the title of the book mentions, uh, the establishment of new international order. And what does this mean? It means that from now on, a UN charter, you all know, prohibits the use of force. So we say states are responsible for starting wars. So they would go probably to ICJ, right? International Court of Justice for that. And this is what we call state responsibility. And international law traditionally does not uh, see individuals as subjects. So this is a very groundbreaking moment where we actually allow heads of states or military top to be prosecuted criminally for starting war. So now war is not just illegal, it's also criminal act. So this is the first, uh, of course, New York, uh, international military tribunal at Nuremberg uh, paved the way for Tokyo. So Tokyo came to affirm as well what the Nuremberg Charter and uh, justices and uh, prosecutors there wanted to do. The second goal is more local in nature, and it's related to occupation. That's why it's dark and painful period, because, well, states are sovereign. They can consent, but Japan could not consent. It had to accept uh, the tribunal. So in this uh, sense, uh, Tokyo Tribunal wanted to uh, fulfill the goal of demilitarization of Japan by stigmatizing those who actually, uh, the military, right? And the second one is democratization. So, and I will talk about that in a moment. Maybe it's not obvious why I'm talking about that now, but I will uh, remind you of that. Another thing that was very important and widely spoken about was creation of historical record. And the Allied powers felt compelled to actually record all these, let's say, um, crimes that happen, but mostly crime of aggression. So although we know that there were many atrocities uh, committed by uh, Japanese troops uh, throughout the Japanese empire. At that time, the Allied powers did not care that much about that. They focused on the crime of aggression because that was important to them. So for them, the goal was basically to create this historical record, how Japanese actually aggression, although there were many aggressions because, I mean, uh, European powers had colonies all over, right? They wanted to actually say that Japanese war was actually very coherent and uh, basically uh, uh, record what happened and how Japan actually uh, planned all these different aggressions and conspired to commit uh, aggression against uh, all these states. And another goal was to re-educate Japanese leaders and to, well, uh, send very big signal to well, leaders in other countries, what can happen to you if you engage in uh, those crimes? So that was very important. And if you if you wish, um, this is where Tokyo Tribunal wanted to uh, have deterrent effect, right? To say, okay, well, if you engage in this, this is what can happen to you. And at, at the end of this, uh, well, uh, first part, I want to uh, mention two things. First is that the Tokyo Tribunal was established in a hurry. There was expediency, there was this rush, do it as soon as possible just for us to start. So already at the end of 1945, the delegations came, but it was very difficult because you can imagine colossal documents and you need to choose people who will be in the indictment, find evidence, it's very little time. You know that today, modern criminal tribunals take a lot of time. It's years of work and we have only actually few prosecutions. So you can imagine, how uh, stressful that was. And another thing is time, because time is really important when we look at um, criminal tribunals, as I said at, at the end, because time brings space for contestation. Because, okay, what happens uh, afterwards? And I will uh, also develop that in another part. And the picture here, you maybe wonder what that is. Well, the picture on the uh, right is a picture of uh, rooms of the former imperial uh, Ministry of Japan that actually where the war plans were made in the wartime Japan. So the Allied powers basically remodeled them and organized trials symbolically in those rooms. And today, this is how it looks today, not far, far away from here. It's actually part of Ministry of Defense compound. And if you want, you can go and let's say visit. Uh, there is a courtroom preserved inside with all these different, let's say, uh, documents that were preserved, and uh, it's quite controversial. You can actually, well, uh, see for yourselves, but there, the, the goal was to preserve uh, 
basically the the experience of the tribunal but uh many people would agree that there there is a lot of um victor's justice narrative going on there but that i would leave to you to judge okay all right so i already talked about uh individual criminal responsibility i already said that yes that was a novelty at the time that actually a person can actually stand and be criminally responsible uh, before uh, international tribunal and this is uh, basically a picture that was a part of a new york times article that was published in 2014 by historian herbert bix that says uh, hirohito string puller not a puppet and this was of course very um, controversial uh, at the time but because this part talks about why the divinity was shielded from the trial, I wanted to start with this uh, picture. Okay, so as I said, Tokyo Tribunal is not primarily about uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity, it's about crimes against peace, right? And today we have uh, the same crime in um, international criminal court. It's called the crime of aggression. However, you know that there are still no prosecutions uh, on that crime, so we didn't come very far. There are some attempts to define what that is, but we don't have, uh, uh, let's say, prosecutions for this crime. So they wanted to prosecute architects for war. So those who actually planned and uh, ordered, uh, let's say, all these different aggressions I just mentioned. So you have to understand that we have two perspectives. The first perspective is a perspective of, uh, let's say, victors, and uh, well, people who were victims, and they see Japanese leaders as war criminals. So for them, these are the worst kind of, let's say, people, right? And then we have defendants themselves, or well, Japanese top military and uh, civilian leaders, among which uh, there are also many diplomats, that actually are thinking, well, we are bad strategists. We did actually very bad political mistakes or strategic mistakes, and actually we brought this country to uh, to the brink, right? Uh, and uh, we endured defeat. So you see that per perspectives are very different. They didn't think about, oh, we violated uh, law because at that time th that law did not exist. And I have to mention that at that time, international law did not prohibit uh, use of force or it did not criminalize. So this is all new created law. So you, we have these two perspectives. Uh, it's interesting, I think, to just mention that part. And then, as I mentioned, this uh, pros prosecution sec section that was established now has to actually form an indictment. So it has to build coherent narrative about Japanese aggression so that it was all premeditated, all concerted, it all makes sense. But how do you do that when you have actually uh, 17 cabinets that changed during uh, war and the uh, 16 prime ministers so there is no linearity there and they actually were all very reactive confrontational so fast changing cabinets let's say added a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, difficulty in uh, finding evidence and also you have very distant geographically theaters of battle that's number one and there is a lack of direct evidence and that's very problematic because in order to incriminate someone, first there must be law and second you have to have probative evidence, right? And emperor was the only constant in all of that. So he was the only, the, so the, the, the throne is the only uh, constant as a source of power and authority to, com to sign treaties or let's say to declare wars, right? And to command the military. And of course, I want to digress slightly. And uh, just as a, as a um, interesting uh, historical event, after the World War I, there was a 1919 peace conference, right? Uh, Versailles Treaty, right, was signed after the World War I. And we discussed at that time whether to try a German emperor, Wilhelm II. And um, of course, there, there were all these different, uh, there was a commission formed to discuss that, uh, whether we can try the emperor, and also the, at that time, the winners of the war were also asked whether we should do it. And interestingly enough, US at that time said no. Actually, President Wilson was the president of the United States at that time. And he said, no, this is a statesman's business. Uh, this is not a, a, a 
how can I say, legal offense, it's, it's actually political offense. And this is something that would amount to the pure act of revenge, so we don't want to do it. This is US delegation in 1919, so after World War I. At that time, British, on the other hand, they were not completely against, but they said, well, if we do it, it's very fastidious, it's going to take time, and public interest will fade. And at, in the end, they will look at those who are tried as martyrs. And this can remind you a little bit of, actually reminds us a little bit of what happened in Tokyo. And Japanese delegation, because at that time, Japan is the only Asian power sitting with uh, other victors in the war, is actually saying out of question, we want uh, to actually uh, state here that we have a lot of issues with trying heads of state. We have uh, emperor ourselves, we don't want to actually engage in that, which made a lot of sense. And then we are now going back again in uh, 1945 and 6. And we see that actually the uh, prosecution of the Japanese emperor is actually very, 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 very polarizing matter. And in that sense, not only the allies are divided on what should be done, but the US within itself is divided. So what, what does this mean? So many people who actually were experts on Japan and one such person was Joseph Gru, who was a US ambassador to Japan. He knew uh, Japan to detail. And then uh, in, 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 an art, in an interview for New York Times in 44 already, so the, the, the war is not uh, over yet, he says, well, yes, I see emperor as a person who is in control of the military, and uh, he will be an important asset for post-war Japan because he will bring coherence to the nation. And, and if we look back even at the major revolution, I'm now going very, very far away, right, in the history, emperor came to unify Jap Japanese nation at the time. So there is this unifying uh, factor that was present. And this was very controversial view because at that time we have widely published reports about Japanese atrocities and people don't like hearing that actually uh, we should not uh, prosecute the emperor, but that we should actually keep him as an asset. Same, still we are in the US, so the Congress adopted resolution that uh, was uh, arguing that he should be prosecuted as a war criminal, that keeping the throne would lead to another war, and uh, that actually we should remove the throne to make Japanese people uh, basically aware of the, their defeat in war. If we uh, move to, let's say, Australia and New Zealand, they actually were absolutely against, of course, uh, not prosecuting the emperor. And even those countries were compiling their own list of, lists of uh, criminals that they wanted to suggest to be tried in the courts, or let's say Australian teams uh, compiled all these lists that actually included uh, the emperor as a war criminal. China was favorable, uh, Great Britain, of course, as a monarchy was opposed. And uh, this is interesting that, of course, amidst all this voice and noise, there was an, an understanding that for strategic purposes, we cannot decide uh, on pro emperor's prosecution. We need to actually, uh, well, delay the decision. and. Uh, basically uh, act accordingly uh, after some time. And here I uh, just uh, gave you a quotation of the one delegate at uh, Far Eastern Commission. I, I, I don't want to get into that, but this was just an institution that was linked uh, at the first phase of the tribunal where the allies tried to make the deci decision-making uh, process all together. And then they would send directives uh, to um, the headquarters of the occupation forces. All right, okay. And then, of course, I believe that you all know this persona. Uh, this is General Douglas MacArthur, who was the general commander uh, of, uh, well, for occupation on behalf of the Allied powers. And in his uh, memoirs, he, well, praised himself that he was a key person that actually understood that we should not remove the emperor. That's questionable. But he uh, advised that uh, we should not try the emperor because this would uh, cause popular upheaval, which means that occupation would require even more military personnel to, well, stop the riots and even more, let's say, uh, uh, well, civilian bureaucrats who should actually come and um, do all these different reforms that we are that uh, well they wanted to do and in view of democratization so in that sense if you if you remember at the beginning i talked about democratization they thought if we want 
to basically get our uh, policies or um, uh, apply our policies smoothly, we need actually cooperation from the Japanese on the ground, and they would not be willing to do that without the emperor. And then, of course, this was a decision at the political level, and then at the more pragmatic level, now we are looking at the tribunal, uh, meaning the preparation phase where international prosecution uh, section chief counsel, Joseph uh, Keenan, he's a very interesting, uh, well, character, and I talk about him in the book. Uh, he didn't have very good reputation, actually, and uh, he was oftentimes absent from, from the tribunal. But he, at that time, ordered that uh, basically teams should work on the fabrication of this narrative that Emperor was a puppet. So this is something, and that some other defendants should actually uh, witness that, uh, well, the Emperor just was coerced into uh, accepting all the decisions that were, uh, well, pre-made by other ministers. And in June 1946, so the trial is already, trial started in April, so this is June, they do the official announcement that the emperor actually would not be tried. And this is interesting because um, in all, all those other defendants who were picked, uh, well, cherry picked for the trial, the prosecution section introduced something that was at that time novelty in international law, which is conspiracy. And what does it mean? It means that, well, just by your official position, you accepted everything. You don't have to do anything. Just by your membership or uh, being in a specific position, you just participated in, in uh, let's say, planning the war. And this came as a glue uh, because they didn't have enough evidence. So technically, if we follow this doctrine, well, emperor was there, right? So in that sense, uh, it's a big contradiction. Funny enough, in the 1950s, uh, Soviets demand, demanded again the trial of the emperor, which is just something that uh, was interesting. And anyways, I think you talked already about how they selected um, basically the, the defendants. There were a lot of files that were, that were considered, actually a lot of people that were considered uh, for, for the doc. But uh, they didn't have a lot of time and they had to just choose over 20, let's say, defendants. And what they did is that they chose people who were the most representative of the specific phase uh, of, the, of the war. So for example, Pearl Har Harbor attack, these were the people, or let's say um, war in Indochina, these were the people. So these, these are the, the, the let's say, um, well, it, it was not that, um, how can I say, it, it's not, uh, Hmm. Anyways, uh, I think that another thing that they considered was uh, institutional memberships of all these different leaders. So all that came together. These multiple criteria came to actually pile up and then uh, make somebody's file win over another one. Of course, evidence. There were no technical rules of evidence, so any sort of evidence was used. They used military, political, intelligence reports, studies, uh, letters, diaries, um, hearsay evidence. So everything was, the, as you can see, the standard was very, very low. And then we are coming uh, to the maybe mo most exciting part <laughs> of the <clears throat> presentation, uh, which are the new geopolitical circumstances. And, uh, but at first, uh, here I want to uh, just briefly talk about A class and B C class um, as, uh, Christoph mentioned before, uh, A-class were also called major war criminals. And everyone, even allied powers, were confused about this classification because when you say major war criminals or A-class, you think these are the worst. And these were actually, uh, the, the class points at the rank, so the highest rank, and the type of crime, which is crime against uh, peace in this case, and minor BC-class uh, criminals. So this complicated a lot, <laughs> the whole understanding on how they should be released and in which order. This means that not only uh, the government, but also population, uh, and as I mentioned, allied powers were all really uh, confused when it comes to this differentiation, even the members of the diet. So this is very important for what's going to happen next. So here we are already, Japan, uh, well, is, a, is conclu concluded peace treaty with not everyone, right? Uh, China, Russia did not conclude peace treaty with Japan. So even what allied power meant at that time changed. 
So here we are, uh, well, um, having independent, newly independent Japan. And there is a question what we will do now with our war criminal program. What's the future of it? And here, uh, well, uh, I uh, used, and here the first um, quotation is by George uh, uh, Keenan. He was a D US diplomat who studied extensively about the Soviet Union. And if you remember, if we talk about the Cold War and uh, uh, he was a Mr. X, right? He wrote this famous uh, uh, telegram uh, and uh, promoted for the containment against the Soviet Union, the policy of containment, if you, I mean, if you're familiar, if not, it doesn't matter. So it's not instrumental. So they saw actually that war crimes program lost its actually purpose, that they wasted time and resources. And they, and actually, he, as he said, and I think uh, Mr. Neidhart also um, quoted that, it had been, it uh, ha have been more efficient and effective to have shot the, capture, the captured Japanese leaders than to organize political trials that are well suited for historians and international politicians and not lawyers, which rather endangered the US image and had nothing to do with domestic legalism. So actually some people within the US government started seeing actually this program as a threat, not only to US image, but also to everything, even to the new order that was um, established, but also to US national interest. Because at that time, we also have the outbreak of the Korean War and Japan is now pressed to rearm, which is funny. We so, saw uh, Japan being asked to actually disarm, but now we are asking Japan to rearm again. So, I, I mean, you can have this second quotation, but it just illustrates uh, my point that actually we should leave uh, the, the past behind and focus on what uh, we want now. And we want now Japan to rearm. And Japan is, of course, naturally resisting that because Japan wants to rebuild itself re economically and does not want to have to invest in its defense at that time. So it wants to outsource its defense to the US. So there were different views on what happens when Japan now concluded the peace treaty. So Japanese thought, well, it's the end of occupation and uh, we want automatic release of war criminals and clearance of Sugamo prison. And one thing that I just want to mention now when I talk about uh, prison is that what brought together all these cl criminals was that they were all in Sugamo prison. So class A and B, C, they were all together in Sugamo prison. So this is where they were kind of equalized, but they were not, of course, differentiation still stand, stands. U.S. was actually concerned and U.S. thought that, no, we cannot just, uh, well, uh, disregard what we invested so much in, which is to preserve the legal character of the uh, war criminal program. So we want to actually keep it legal. We have to do it properly, meaning examine cases on a, well, uh, individually, case by case ba basis. We cannot, uh, well, afford to uh, apply collective political solutions, basically. And they wanted, of course, to uh, avoid embarrassment because, of course, not so long ago, they said another thing and uh, they didn't want to uh, aggravate uh, their public opinion. So San Francisco Peace Treaty has two clauses that are relevant, which is that Japan actually accepts judgments, number one, and two, that Japanese government can recommend the release of uh, war criminals, but the decision has to be approved by allied powers. So, uh, well, those allied powers that concluded peace treaty. So still they wanted to preserve the international character and collective decision making. Things now get interesting is that Japanese government at that time, of course, had that idea, but where the where was the how can I say the spot where we started asking for their release was actually families, families and relatives of those war criminals, because uh, having their, let's say, um, well, husbands in prison was not uh, it, it actually destroyed families, it, uh, it affected their income. And those who would, let, let's say, be released uh, were discriminated at the time. They would have issues finding employment, etc. So at, at the same time is financial and emotional hardship. And 
families at that time, because this was underreported, mobilized to actually, uh, well, uh, publicize the issue. And this is 1952, the year that Japan gained uh, independence. And slowly but surely, they are actually gaining momentum. Throughout the 1953, there are a lot of different private organizations, even religious organizations or municipal organizations. And public opinion now, because they're hearing about it, is actually uh, focused on their cause. Of course, at first, their focus was were not class A war criminals, because at that time, people still remembered and associated them with uh, hardships that they lived after war, the poverty and, uh, well, uh, misery that they lived. So for them, they were not part of this movement at the beginning. So now what is interesting is that people thought that if actually Japan now as an independent state cannot actually enjoy its freedom, then it means that Japan is almost paying debt to the world community, Japanese people, because now it's a social problem. So then it's no longer only individual guilt, it's a collective guilt. So there was this idea that the whole, uh, well, nation was suffering and not only uh, criminals and that these, um, this inability to, to release these war criminals meant that we are preserving the past still. So this led to their engagement at the international level because at that time Japanese government didn't do much and I will explain uh, why. So all those associations were writing uh, different uh, letters and uh, sending petitions to uh, foreign governments or organizations abroad and even let's say uh, Japanese uh, diaspora was very active uh, to that effect in different countries. Of course they were asking for release. So at that time, uh, what is interesting and where everything gets even gathers even more strength as a movement is uh, the release after um, after the occupation of uh, war criminal suspects, A class war criminal suspects. So these were well politicians of the war era that were uh, maybe not necessarily. I mean, th these uh, are uh, so Shige Mitsumamuru was also uh, well tried, prosecuted by the Tokyo Tribunal. So he was in prison uh, until 1950, so for four years. But the rest were war criminal suspects. So they were in confinement, uh, well, uh, for a few years, or they were released earlier. But they were actually prohibited from engaging in public life because uh, they, they were, uh, I mean, there was a SCAP directive that prohibited that. So now when Japan was independent, it meant that they can actually come back and engage again in uh, political and uh, social life. So you can imagine that these people have personal and institutional link to the cause of war criminals. So this is where actually we can bring this uh, issue to the political level. So it's not no longer just social uh, issue, it become, it's becoming political issue that many politicians will even use to gather political votes. And at that time, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Shigeru Yoshida, I'm, I'm sure that well, you all know about him. He, he actually, for him, the, the well, war criminals were not a priority. For him, economic rebuilding of Japan and uh, well, trade. So basically, uh, Japan's comeback in the community of nations was priority. So he didn't want to agitate uh, foreign, uh, let's say, officials. And it's interesting that even within the Japanese government, we had institutional conflicts. Ministry of Foreign Affairs had more awareness because they interacted with uh, foreign officials that this is a very sensitive matter and that actually they should gradually release war criminals. Whereas Ministry of Justice thought, no, now we are sovereign state. We need to urgently uh, ask for our people being released from our own prisons. At the same time, Diet was also engaging and uh, trying to actually pressure the government to do something. And even interestingly, they uh, revised this uh, law that actually allowed war criminals to go on a provisional parole. So for 15 days, they could go out of prison for unspecified circumstances, and then they could renew it. And of course, that, that um, well, uh, allied powers didn't like that because they didn't authorize any of that. At the same time, Sugamo prison was almost, if you can imagine, as a society. They organized all these different, there were kabuki plays, baseball games, they engaged. There was a social life within, but also they also became uh, angered because they're trapped in prison. 
So uh, the Sugamo Prison Committee in 1953 warned that actually the situation in prison is not really good and that actually there are threats of mass escape and that something should be done. And something was done, uh, again, uh, by allied powers, of course, and uh, led by the US, because the US uh, still remained the main uh, actor uh, behind the whole thing. So the Clemency and Parole Board was established at that time in the US, and uh, the, the idea was the Japanese government would recommend uh, prisoners to war criminals, uh, if, you, if you would like, to be released. And then the US and other allied powers in DC would vote whether that's possible or not. However, again, US was, uh, well, dragging its feet, if I may say so. And uh, there were a lot of in institutional division within the US. So Department of State was divided. So you had people within uh, the department that were mostly from political sections that were actually uh, saying, we need to grant them amnesty altogether and just release them. And because this protracted uh, detention of war criminals is hurting our interests, because Japan is, again, refusing to move on defense issues or any other issues because uh, they are not being, uh, well, granted any concessions regarding war criminals. Whereas legal uh, section was all for legal solution, case by case, and that takes, of course, a lot of time. Uh, many people at that time within U.S. that also were knowledgeable about Japan warned about the, 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 the dangers of this protracted det detention. And interestingly, at that time, uh, USSR and China that had Japanese prisoners of war in their custody organized trials, and they actually called, called those prisoners of war war criminals. And they offered at that time to repatriate slowly those war criminals back to Japan. Of course, that that would make the allied powers look back because even USSR and China are doing their part of the job and uh, sending people back. So this is an interesting uh, quote uh, by um, a person, well, one official from legal affairs section of State Department, because he's saying, if we thought this, let's say, uh, seven years ago, do we still think that there were criminals? If not, we actually, uh, well, lost our time and resources. Interestingly, I mentioned Keenan, if you remember, so the, ch the chief prosecutor, and when he was consulted by the criminal, uh, by clemency and parole board on whether they should release class A criminals, this is what he said. Quasi all 12 criminals could be released without danger to world peace. It was not much about deterring effect, but rather it was used to inform Japanese people on how they got into war and to reduce effect of exalted functions of defendants on people. So this is what he's saying, and he's basically, uh, in the book, it's written more in detail, giving them uh, advice. Oh, these are dangerous people. These are okay, so they are not that aggressive. So basically, he's just casually recommending people. Of course, allied powers, as I mentioned, were very divided. And uh, again, they thought if Class A criminals are released, then it means that BC criminals would also be released. So these two things were actually connected. Uh, well, Great Britain was opposed and bothered by Japan's rearmament, and also Great Britain was very bothered because, of course, it lost its prestige after World War II, and it didn't like the relation U.S. had with uh, Japan at the same time. Uh, Dutch were also opposed to releases, especially because of the public opinion. France, interestingly, was in favor of parole, so they wanted some sort of movement on the issue. And the U.S., that Japanese government expected would do something and push for the release of war criminals was actually, when we look at the, the records of the, that criminal parole board, their delegates were always abstaining from voting or actually saying no. And the agreement between allied powers was that Japanese should not know who voted what. So not to use this uh, for, well, division purposes, right? So in that sense, Japanese government thought that the US was working in its interest, whereas that was not the case. And of course, US embassy in Tokyo that was, of course, urging the US government to speed up the whole process uh, was basically, again, reasserting that actually public opinion is angered and they know that actually uh, even their prime minister, Yoshida, nor US is behind them, that they're left to their own devices. And this brings me to the last part of the, of the presentation. 
that actually uh, talks about the cabinets uh, that came after Yoshida. So Yoshida lost power at the end of 1954. And then we have, uh, well, uh, Hatoyama and then Kishi cabinets that are relevant uh, to the war criminal uh, cause. So already in 1954, so at that same time, the Criminal in Par Parole Board decides to revise the rules. And Allied agrees that now, if prisoners who received life sentences, and most of the prisoners in the, uh, of well, Class A prisoners were lifers, so they were giving life sentences, uh, can actually be released after 10 years. So this was just automatic rule, thinking that this will speed up the process. And at that time, uh, we have a Hatoyama cabinet uh, uh, that, that was um, established. And Hatoyama said uh, that his priority in his first address in the Diet said that his priority is return of Okinawa and uh, dealing with war criminals. And he said that actually the US op public opinion has to understand that uh, 10 years after the war, the Japanese actually want to liberate themselves uh, from remnants of war and uh, ensure that there is a general release of prisoners and full freedom which is actually not possible in the moment. So these are the people who had this personal and institutional link who are now coming at the political level as a part of the government to push for their, uh, well, Asian colleagues, if I may say. So Mamoru Shigemitsu at that time, he was a uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and he uh, traveled with uh, Nobusuke Kishi. So you heard uh, before uh, he was mentioned, uh, well, uh, Prime, former Prime Minister Abe's paternal, maternal grandfather. So they actually uh, started pressing the US, uh, I mean, US delegation and saying that, I mean, they uh, don't understand uh, how can the US expect them to rearm whereas they have their uh, military and war criminals in prison. So basically, and they also uh, said that this was a personal plea. So this was uh, meant to leave an impression upon the US. So I already mentioned that the rule changed. And then in 1954, so at the end of 1954, actually, when the cabinet uh, came to, was established, two uh, cla uh, A-class war criminals were released on medical parole. What does it mean? Because these men were old. Many of them were over 70 with a lot of different diseases, let's say. And even, even so, for example, in the book, there is um, more descriptions on that. For example, if they would give their medical uh, reports, uh, criminal and parole board would not admit it. They would ask American doctor to go and examine them just to ascertain that this was not false. So they were always making this process more difficult. And then in the end, uh, well, throughout the 1955, I mean, this is still a Hatoyama cabinet, uh, Allies, I mean, uh, agreed that throughout 1955, the, the rest of the A-class war criminals will be uh, released. And most of them were released on medical parole. So for medical reasons, one was just parole. So after that, uh, we have Kishi cabinet. And this is already 1958, so end of 1950s. And you know that uh, we are approaching the signing of the security treaty be between uh, US and Japan. So he actually came and asked, although they were all out now, right? Uh, A-class war criminals. He asked uh, for their amnesty. And Americans actually liked Kishi because he was pro-rearmament. And for them, it was great, uh, even at that time, MacArthur II, uh, who was ambassador, uh, US ambassador to Japan, said that actually he was a person they could do business with, actually push their interest to another level. And then uh, he actually uh, said that he wanted them to actually be forgiven because he had political plans for many of them. They wanted to actually go back to the world of politics and they wanted to clear this stigma uh, and wipe their guilt. So to remove anti-American feeling, that's how he put it. But if you look at it, this was a foreign judgment. Basically, according to Japanese national law, they could actually just go back to office because the uh, Tokyo Tribunal of Judgments was seen as a foreign judgment, not as a domestic one, right? And in the end, of course, they made a lot of fuss and they didn't want to just grant them, uh, you know, uh, amnesty, but they said, okay, we will reduce sentences. So in 1958, uh, they were all having, they all had their uh, sentences reduced. And interestingly, at that time, even foreign ministry did not want to call them class A 
um, war criminals, they called them class A related persons. So there were all these kind of uh, signs that they wanted actually just to leave this um, war period behind. Of course, um, I will not spend a lot of time uh, talking about what all of, the, all of them did once they went out, but many of them engaged in the political life, or some of them also participated in different radio emissions where they talked about actually how the conditions in the prison were actually very good and very lax. They were having a lot of fun, basically. And uh, at that time, of course, that was discrediting uh, the whole war criminal uh, program. And then, uh, well, we are now going, uh, and we are now in uh, 1968, where, when actually uh, 14 Class A war criminals were secretly enshrined to Yasukuni Shrine. And that's a private organization. It's not public, right? So there are accounts that the emperor actually was furious and, uh, um, let's say, refused, or, I mean, wanted to refuse that, right? Uh, and this meant that we are actually uh, celebrating war dead. We are commemorating them. And once they are enshrined there, they become divinity, right? If we look at, uh... and of course, not so far away from Yasukuni Shrine, we have another building because today I also forgot to mention there was one a slide with Sugamo prison, right? Another building that is problematic is Yushukan. That is a war memorial museum where you can actually see a lot of, um, let's say, um, well, Victor's justice narrative and a lot of, uh, well, revisionist narrative. And it's problematic, not only a Sukuni shrine, but the museum itself. And I think that the Tokyo Tribunal, as an experience, is inviting us to think um, more closely how we can use these institutions in peace processes, what can they do? Because obviously, uh, all those goals that I told you at the beginning, none of them and other than del at that time, uh, delegitimizing del those leaders was achieved. Of course, Japanese constitution prohibited Japan from uh, having standing right military and the stigma is there and Tokyo Tribunal is related to that. Uh, but still a lot of uh, issues were created because of Tokyo Tribunal and because the, the judgment invited uh, others to contest this version of history that was created by the uh, judgment. I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Babovic. Uh, we come now to the Q&A. And as I always say, this is not a press conference, so you are entitled to opinions, but please keep it short. If you are here in the hall, please use the microphone. And by the way, uh, about housekeeping, I forgot to mention the masks. Actually, you were supposed to wear masks, but um, I didn't see it. Uh, if those uh, members uh, that watch are watching on Zoom, they can give a sign to uh, Moribaki-san, and then I will know that you want to ask a question. So who goes first to ask? Otherwise, uh, I go. Um, uh, one, yes. Oh, sorry. Please, yeah. You please use the microphone. Yes, please. And you please introduce yourself, yes? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. I look forward to reading your book. Sorry, uh, my name is Jonathan Hafitz. I'm a professor at um, a law professor in the United States, um, but I'm a Fulbright scholar in Japan, teaching at uh, Rikyo and and and, uh, and Tokyo at Todai. Uh, and I study uh, international criminal law, uh, one of my subjects. So um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm, I guess uh, to Two questions. Uh, one is, um, uh, I guess you would think the legacy of, if you could say a little bit more about the legacy of the Tokyo uh, Tribunal uh, for the crime of aggression, uh, which as you, you kind of mentioned was the foc main focus, uh, although what after was um, sort of uh, uh, had a much slower development than the other aspects of international criminal law. And even though 
uh, is part of the ICC statute is was added later and is subject to a different regime, make it a more complicated prosecution. So uh, talk about that. And then I guess I just uh, uh, because all uh, to me, you know, uh, the past uh, Tokyo Tribunal, Nuremberg, ICTY, all these tribunals now kind of look out through the lens of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so to curious what your uh, what your uh, thinking is with the prospect of how we think about uh, crime of aggression. Um, and I'll, you know, quote the, I think the Nuremberg Tribunal, which said the, uh, in its judgment that it's the, you know, all the, all the it's the accumulated crimes or uh, aggression is the linchpin for everything. I'm paraphrasing some of the quote in front of me, but that uh, essentially without the crime of aggression, we don't, you know, we don't have other war crimes and crimes against humanity. It's, you know, mm -hmm. why it's the supreme, the supreme crime. So I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. your thoughts, especially thinking of, about this from today's uh, perspective where Ukraine uh, uh, dominates. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, do you have a second question? Because... No, that was it, they were together. Ah, okay, yeah. okay, sure. So yeah, thank I guess development of your... crime of aggression and then Ukraine related. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank thanks. you very much. Yeah. Uh, I should write yes. that, okay. Uh, well, in the Rome Statute uh, for crime of aggression, um, Again, there was no, to this day, we didn't prosecute anyone, right? Uh, actually, there were some subsequent Nuremberg trials that uh, tried few individuals for crime of aggression, but later on, but we didn't have anything. And I think that uh, there was some work done even by UN General Assembly and International Law Commission to define better the crime of aggression. But I think practically developments, uh, when it comes to use of force, have stretched a lot. What it, or how do we even allow today? What is legal and what's not legal, right? When it comes to use of force, I'm saying, because uh, UN Charter says we can use force in self-defense or collective self-defense, right? But then we have uh, with Iraq, preemptive self-defense. And with all these different, Libya was a humanitarian intervention. So we are adding human protection of human rights as a reason to go and use force. So this complicates, I believe, even where we are with the crime of aggression. Mm -hmm. And the second question is related to Ukraine. I think we think the same way we thought about cri crime of aggression, that the, the, the prosecution in, is reserved to non-liberal camp mm -hmm. in many ways. So as uh, I mean, there were calls by uh, ICC prosecutor to uh, open an investigation, right, in the case of Ukraine. But I think it's going to be very difficult to get <laughs> Vladimir Putin in mm. the hands of the ICC because of different, um, well, uh, impediments. Uh, and also, let's say uh, Russia is not member state of ICC and ICC is not impose imposed, right? It's uh, consensual in nature. And the second point is that even when we have UN Security Council being able to refer cases, well, Russia is on the Security Council and permanent member of Security Council. So that complicates further the whole thing. But it, all these events always make us think about that. We mm -hmm. think about, OK, we wanted to do that. And then what did we learn or what did we achieve with that? So I would say today, not much, <laughs> because we have a lot of instances of aggression that were never, I mean, criminally prosecuted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I hope I answered. I mean, there's much more to this, but I think. I, yeah, I've, I've, I have a follow up, but I'll leave it uh, so this year. But thank you. That okay, you can come up later. Yeah, or exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yes, Todd, please. Yes, please. <clears throat> I may be wrong, but I think that the Allies did not try to persecute the germ warfare unit to 731. Why, why not? Uh, well, Mr. Neidhart mentioned that, but um, even during the trial, there was some evidence uh, that, well, was found about uh, th those units. However, at that time, um, there was an order uh, to leave it for later date. Uh, and even after that, one of the investigators was relocated from Tokyo to DC. He was sent back because there was a larger, uh, well, political goal of keeping whatever Japanese basically uncovered and, um, well, uh, found 
that came into uh, U.S. hands. So this is they, they didn't want to prosecute it also because of that, because they wanted that uh, information for themselves. So when it comes to bacteriological uh, weapons, yeah. Who is next? Otherwise, uh, it's my turn. OK, sure. The way you showed it to us uh, diplomatically, the US lost at the end. The, the, war crimin the whole war criminal aspect became an asset for Japan. Kishi could, ne could use them, mm -hmm. could negotiate mm -hmm. them. On the other hand, you, said, you say in a final conclusion of your book, where, where you discuss the value of this kind of uh, uh, tribunals uh, in general, you say it might be more useful for the victor nations than for the losers. Mm -hmm. But in that case, Japan actually uh, proved you wrong. Or mm -hmm. Japan shows that uh, you can uh, smartly use the, even mm -hmm. this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, can you uh, explain that contradiction? Sure. What I meant by that, I think if I uh, refer to the, sometimes we write things and forget, but I think what I wanted to say was that um, at least in the first phase, those who benefit from it are uh, victors nations because they don't get to be prosecuted for what they did. And again, um, of course, I understand that it's impossible to include their crimes in any tribunal that they organize, right? But at the same time, uh, it's problematic, right? Because if we look at the legal, um, let's say, norms, they should be applied uniformly. So in that sense, I want to say that they actually are above that law. So they create law and then they stay above it. So we don't have rule of law to the end. That, that's what I mean. But yes, the conclusion of the book actually is that those, um, uh, let's say, experiences of uh, war, uh, war criminal tri trials can become an asset when they link that issue to getting concessions on some other issue. So this is, uh, I mean, maybe it's a contradiction, but I just think that these two uh, focus on different things, different aspects. So it, it, it's in that sense that I meant it, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. My name is Maeda Tatsuo. Uh, I'm a retiree looking for a big uh, business management worldwide. My, I'm, I'm very much interested in especially post-war, pre-war his, history, but uh, maybe not directly related to the tri tribunal, but concerning the change of personnel after 1945, not just the uh, indictment of mm -hmm. the political or military uh, uh, leaders, mm -hmm. but also many Japanese businessmen and bureaucrats mm -hmm. were ousted from uh, mm -hmm. purged. Mm -hmm. And that really helped Japanese bureaucracy and Japanese business because everybody above 50, mm -hmm. maybe 45, mm -hmm. were purged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that made Japanese business and bureaucracy very, very young. Mm -hmm and energetic mm -hmm. and also probably more democratic mm -hmm. in thinking and that and that didn't change even after 52 mm -hmm. but in the in the contrast polit politics journalism mm -hmm. and academy mm -hmm. all those people who maybe conspired conspired is not the it's too strong word but all all people who was involved mm -hmm. in the establishment and, it's, and somehow connected with the war, remain yes. like Kishi Hatoyama, Yomi, Shoriki of Yomiuri. Mm -hmm. well, like Shoriki was very, very criminal pe person, mm -hmm. but he was the president of Yomiuri. Pre-war, after the war, very influential. Mm -hmm. And uh, why, why, why do you think mm -hmm. this contrast happened? Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not just the United States, but for the Japanese. Uh, mm -hmm. Japanese society, mm -hmm. but uh, this is kind of extraordinary contrast. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, well, even for me, but uh, my thoughts are on that uh, are that 
even during the occupation, I think the the allied powers had to shake hands with some devils, right? So in that sense, I think many times they made, um, well, strategic or, or political decisions. So I think because Japan at the end of the war was also victim, uh, and that was never addressed of atomic bombings, right? Uh, I think that they basically wanted just to leave that behind and just go on with whatever they could go on with. So I think that um, after the experience of the Tokyo Tribunal and of course with all other small well trials that happened elsewhere, I don't think that there was any discussion at the national level or any other measure by which they could actually point figure, fingers at different people. So I just think that uh, the reach of the occupation was limited, even when it comes to who will be eliminated. So I understood it that way. I'm not sure does it make sense, but I think uh, it's very complex. And I do think that in, in many different stages um, of the well peace process, sometimes those who well are intervening have to make difficult choices and even uh, well befriend people who are, as you said, maybe more warlike or aggressive. So this is at the moment what I can say. But thank you very much for your comment. Anybody else? Otherwise, I have uh, uh, probably concluding questions. It's, mm -hmm. uh, we are almost we are already a bit over time. Okay. Uh, maybe you say a word or two about the evidence. I mean, uh, the Japanese government destroyed a lot of documents. A lot of documents were destroyed by the Tokyo firestorm. Mm -hmm. But then uh, the diary of uh, the emperor's personal secretary became evidence. Uh, this is probably a bit um, maybe strange that the emperor's diary is become evidence and then uh, or the emperor's secretary's diaries become evidence but then the emperor is not even uh, a standing trial well i think you are correctly observing that it's strange but i think that they didn't have a lot of choice i think expediency as i said dictated a lot of choices that they made so when you don't have actually anything to work with you're desperately going for whatever can be uh well, uh, of any property value. So I think that the, the, and also they were not bound by any, as I said, technical rules of evidence. So at the, at, at the end, uh, as I mentioned, the decision to, to um, keep the throne was strategic. So for them, it didn't matter. And I think in such a short span of time, they for sure made a lot of mistakes and that's what we can see today but for them at that time was no we need to make this work i think many people even had personally believed that these people should be all prosecuted so they really went they had pro prosecution bias if i may say so i think that that um, is something that we can see well today and at the time probably it was not part of what was visible to all of us but if we look at the uh, institutional black box we can see that there were many contradictions and many strange things happening. I mean, starting from who was and how uh, um, selected for the trial or what we used as evidence. I mean, they used military reports or studies about pre-war Japan to actually, um, well, suggest that Japan is actually militaristic in nature. I mean, they're its leaders. So they actually used everything that was on their hand just to basically uh, build a case. and when they saw that it's actually not coherent they said okay let's introduce conspiracy and that was something that was actually inspired by uh well uh u.s domestic law because i believe uh, com uh commonwealth countries have the, or common law has um uh, this this uh category roman law does not have it so they use the conspiracy basically to kind of glue everything so they say like okay you just by being there you are participating in this and I assume none or hardly any of these prosecutors and judges could uh, read these uh, evident evidence or documents in original language. I don't think any of these uh, yes. judges spoke Japanese. No, uh, that was a technical problem because they had would, so many materials and very little translators. So sometimes Japanese would borrow them translators and then you, well, you're wondering about how you know partial they are or impartial sorry would you say that of course this was pre-television but the trial was more for cameras than for for justice 
that also it might be because at that time it was very important how it looks right because the the, the eyes were all there right and then at some point uh, as the public attention waned they actually thought that well now what's the interest in us pursuing all of that although there were people who really believed that they should uh continue to preserve this because they understood that they will be judged by history if i may say did i trigger any additional question otherwise i ask you to give alexandra babovic a great hand thank you very much thank for you very coming. much thank you and as a token of our um, uh, gratefulness you get a one year free membership thank you so much thank you <laughs> thank you thank you very much for coming everybody thank you for coming